Pour your spirit out, Lord. Let's all declare, Lord, pour out your spirit this morning. We prophesy that your wind is blowing, that it's a new day, Lord, that the wind of God's blowing in this place and your spirit is being poured out upon your sons and your daughters. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 We praise you, Lord, this morning. Hey. Hey, hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah. Woo, we just praise you, Lord, and we give you glory and honor. And we all said, amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for worshiping and coming ready to worship, even though it was a little different than what we're used to, right? But the anointing, whoo, the anointing is on it. The anointing is on our worship team. The anointing is in this place. The Holy Spirit is wherever we are gathered together. Amen. Well, I have a few announcements, and one I'm just going to reiterate if you weren't here first thing this morning. Uh, We read a statement that we just want to encourage all of us to be extra vigilant about adhering to our health and safety protocols. As you know and probably read in the news, numbers of COVID cases, flu, influenza A, influenza B, other viruses are on the rise in our communities and within our church body. Daycares, schools, workplaces, young and old are both affected. Many children have been are out of school due to sicknesses or they are in quarantine. Many viruses are indiscriminate to who they attack. So let's just be extra vigilant and precautious. If you have a virus symptoms, we just ask that you would please stay home. Please wear a mask when you're moving about our building. We ask you to worship as we did this morning from our chairs and keep a healthy distance from each other and who are not in your family or your social bubble. Keep our hands sanitized, avoid hugging and close contact. And I know that is very, very hard for us, but the Lord has been very gracious to us um, to allow us to um, say no um, and fist bump, amen? So we wanna keep your children with you. Do your best to minimize close interaction with others. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care for one another. We have exhibited great love and care for one another in this body. If you become sick, let your pastors know right away so we can pray for you, amen. We've seen many answers to prayer, many people healed in our body. Um, So let us know, we can pray for one another. Thank you for all that you have done. We wanna encourage one another, build each other up because we are overcomers, amen. We are overcomers. Glory from glory to glory to glory to glory. We are overcomers. And whatever hurdles have been thrown at us, the Lord has anointed us to be an overcomer. Amen. And so we're going to keep worshiping. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep declaring the word. We're going to keep prophesying. Lord, let your spirit flow in this place. Amen. So in light of that, that is all of my announcements. Thank you for your um, undivided attention and our life-changing announcements. Amen. And I do think that we have a few testimonies. Is that correct, Pastor Gary? And then Pastor Gary will be bringing a life-changing announcement. If you, JB, had a testimony, and who else? Melinda. Okay. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise our wonderful, amazing, and mighty God. We give you praise this morning. I asked Pastor Gary, could I share? Uh, I, I, I believe it's a testimony. It's, it, it's filled with tragedy, but God is good. God is good. About three weeks ago, I walked with a friend. Her oldest son was killed in an accident. He was stalled on not stalled, he was sitting in stalled traffic on I-74 and uh, a semi-truck. A semi-truck ran into the back of them. They have construction, about 20 miles of construction on I-74 and a semi-truck ran into the back of him and his friend and he was killed instantly And his friend was lifeline to Methodist Hospital, but she died also. And then yesterday, he was just in his early 40s. And yesterday, I eulogized my 35-year-old niece. She was found dead on Monday, and as uh, on last Monday. And as I was praying, I heard this in the spirit. I believe, I perceive, I heard this in the spirit. There is an SOS. 
There is an SOS, there's a distress call in the spirit. There is a river, and this comes out of the, the, of the conference, the prophetic conference, because I heard pastor say something, and it just overflowed my spirit, and it has not let me go. He talked about him and his father going past a, a, a field of crops. I don't know if anybody remembers that. And praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm telling you, it touched me in a deep way. And the crops died. And pastor looked at his dad and told his dad that farmer, that harvester, did not understand the river. He didn't understand the river. And this is what I perceive the Lord said to me, there is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of our God. The SOS in the spirit is to know the river, to learn the river, to learn the ebb and flow of the river. Don't miss, your, don't let the river overtake your crops. Don't miss your harvest. Don't miss your harvest. And the only way you're going to harvest in the spirit is that you know the river. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everyone say kingdom focus. Kingdom focus. We are kingdom focused on a harvest. Amen. The Lord is moving on the harvest and he is the Lord of the harvest. So JB. First Thessalonians 5.16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I'd heard the pray continually thing many, things, many times in my life, and I had a revelation of me deeper meaning of that. But what does it mean to rejoice always? My wife and I had the opportunity to, to go to Virginia for a conference. And a man by the name of Will Hart, who's a part of Iris Global, uh, a ministry that's based out of northern Mozambique ministered. And he shared a testimony. He went there. For those of you who don't know, northern Mozambique is undergoing a, a very violent civil war. Al-Shabaab um, is killing and destroying people who aren't Muslim enough and Christians. Um, and indiscriminately, it, it's very violent. And this is where this ministry is. This is where their pastors are. They feed tens of thousands of people every day in this part of northern Mozambique. They've been there for 30, almost 30 years. And he goes there and he listens to these five pastors from the village and one of them's telling his story about what happened when they came and attacked his village. And this man is talking about, he hasn't seen his wife since the attack. He has his, one of his older children with him. They don't know where his wife is. She, she fled, they went different directions. When they went back afterwards, his four-year-old was laying there, dead, and the choicest cuts of meat were gone. And Will said after these five men shared similar stories and talked about it about two hours, they got up and they began to worship. And they began to praise. And I lose my joy when my contractor's late, when noodles get spilled on the carpet. I get angry and sin. There's more to rejoicing always. And I'm just so grateful for everything in my life. Thank you. Well, let's just stand and let's just rejoice in the Lord this morning. Let's just praise the Lord. Lord, we just praise you. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you glory this morning. No matter what's happening, we give you glory. You are the King of Kings and you are the Lord of Lords and you are the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you are the Lord of the harvest. We give you glory. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. Woo. 
You are the Holy One. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, blessings to you this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, We want to keep uh, Pastor Jeff. Pastor Ignacia, or Pastor Ignacio leaves tomorrow, and uh, Pastor Eric and Pastor Isaac are all traveling, ministering. So uh, you guys keep your pastors in in prayer. And uh, man, what an awesome time! Isn't this great? Praise the Lord! What a great time! It's a great time to rejoice. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I've got a little message to bring to you this morning, so we're going to jump into 1 Samuel 14. If you want to go ahead and get your Bibles primed and open there, that's where we're going to go. We're going to continue on a little bit with the story of Saul and Jonathan as they, uh, as Jonathan attacks the Philistine army. Kind of pick up where we left off the last time I had the opportunity to share with you. I think the title of that was Turning Your Maybe into a Miracle. Tonight, today, The title is Maybe Tomorrow. Somebody say, Maybe Tomorrow. Now say it like you mean it. Maybe Maybe. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. All right, so you're going to have to help me interact just a little bit, okay? You're going to have to help me interact a little bit, okay? All right, just remember, you're at a church where you can talk out loud. All right? Praise the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got some freedom here. Praise the Lord. Did you like to worship? Amen. If you're watching online, um, did they see that online too? Did they? Okay, just a little disclaimer. We're not nearly as cool as we look. Have you ever watched us online? Like I, I watch online sometimes and I see the backdrop and I'm like, man, what a cool church. And I think, that's, we're not that cool. We're really not that cool. But Jesus is very, very cool, right? And when he puts his anointing on something, it gets even cooler, right? So I really enjoy that. I mean, the, the way they pulled that off is just so, so good. I don't know what your history is, but the church that I pastored before I came here, our worship team was actually Hillsongs. Yeah, pretty popular. Uh, we didn't have videos then. That was like 20 years ago. But we did have the CDs. The, the, I mean, actually, the little hard things. You know what? They may have been tapes then. I can't remember, but they weren't eight tracks. They were the little white ones, but we mixed our own. Hill Songs was our main worship team. And, uh, man, we worshiped. Some of the best worship I ever remember having was, was like what we just did. It's so freeing. You know, so I, I totally enjoyed it. And, our, I mean, our, our worship team does such a great job. So uh, we're, we are super blessed, aren't we? We were talking last, a uh, couple weeks ago when I had the opportunity to share about the story in 1 Samuel 14. I'm not going to go back over all of it. We're not going to go through all of that again, but I encourage you to read it. I want to summarize just a little bit, but we talked a lot about the different moments in life and how your life basically is made up of just millions of minutes. And of all those minutes, there's certain moments that draw significance. And there's moments in your life that happen where they actually, I would call them divine moments. Now, the world wouldn't understand that because we, we relate divine back to divinity, back to God, meaning God places these moments in your life. And how many of you can remember a, a moment in your life where everything changed? It could have been a word. It could have been like something you just read. It could have been a situation. I know in my life I've had prophetic words, what we call prophetic words, where we come up for prayer. And the person speaking can just say one phrase and it just cuts you to the heart. Like it just goes directly in. It just touches something inside of you. Anybody remember a time in your life like that? Like I would call that a divine moment. And God directs our lives and he, he basically puts these bookmarks in our lives that, that changes. Some of those are bad. You know, hello. Oh, I'm sorry. We're way too charismatic for that. Okay. Let me just tell you, sometimes things are bad. Oh, I'm sorry to bust your bubble. But this sister just got up and testified about people dying. 
JB just stood up and testified and rejoicing over a four-year-old child dying. But you know, in my life, I look at these divine moments, and one thing I remember, Pastor, more than anything, nothing in my life of any significance ever came easy. Nothing that actually meant anything. You know, the, the easy stuff. Why is it we always pray for the easy? Do you ever, you ever get that, Craig? I mean, how many of you have just said, oh, God, make my life easy? Oh, God, make my promotion come easy. God, this job I need, make it come easy. Lord, I'm working on this car. Please make it easy. I never remember the easy stuff. The significant things in my life, those bookmark things in my life, those really important, crucial things in my life were hard. It, it is really hard when the doctor says you'll never walk again. It, I wish I could get an amen at this Presbyterian church. So sometimes these divine moments, oh, praise God, I'm glad you're here. I'm going to use you as an example. Actually, I'm probably not going to get to use the same example since you're here, but I'll go lighter on you since you're here. These divine moments, if you capture them, even though they're difficult, can give you momentum to move you into what God wants you to do. Moments and momentum. Minutes, moments, and momentum. So that's what we're talking about. We're looking at the story of Saul and Jonathan. Two men in the exact same moment with two very different outcomes. As you know the story, they're outnumbered. 10,000 to 1 is what some theologians say. They don't have any swords, any weapons, any way to protect themselves. Saul takes a different path. Saul says, we're not going to fight. We're just going to go lay down. We're going to take a nap. We talked a little bit about how some people deal with stress. Saul's dealing with stress is sleeping. So he just said, I'm, I'm going to take a nap. I'm not, I'm not going to deal with it. Jonathan, on the other hand, where we pick this up sometime, somewhere around verse 8, Jonathan says this. In the middle of the night, who knows, maybe he was, maybe he was awake all night. He knew there was a battle looming. He knew something had to happen. He knew something bigger than him had to happen. He looks at his armor bearer. He nudges his armor bearer. He wakes his armor bearer up, and he says this. Let's go pick a fight. So let me say this right off the bat. I shared this with the first service. Um, this is a little bit different than the we, way we look at armor bearers. Now, I'm from the South. Somebody could say, obviously. It's okay to talk, okay? Wow, what is going on here? I, we just did video worship. I think we have a video congregation. Have you seen those ridiculous things where they're doing things and there's just pictures of people in the background of the ear? Lord, that's got to be tough. Thank you for that yep back there. I'm from the South. So there's a different type of religion and different type of theologies, different type of doctrines, different type of churches. And a lot of churches, you have to be something. Like you have to be a bishop, you have to be an apostle, you have to be an armor bearer. So the armor bearers that I'm used to seeing are people who carry a briefcase for the big guy. You know, I got your water, I got your towel. You know, blotting the, blotting the sweat off your brow. That's not this armor bearer we're talking about. Okay, so we're talking about an armor bearer here who actually bears armor. Now remember, remember the situation. Just kind of get this in your mind. The Hebrews are in a situation much like we're in right now in the United States. They don't have any weapons. To get their weapons sharpened or made, they have to go to the enemy and pay the enemy. There are two swords in the entire nation. One is held by Saul. One is held by Jonathan, the prince. The armor bearer for both of these men not only carry their sword, but they carry their shield. They carry their helmet. They carry anything it takes to go to battle. Now, my friend over here can tell you when you go to battle as a foot soldier, you carry your own stuff. You don't have an armor bearer. The unique thing about this is the armor bearer, when he came to this point of actually confrontation with the enemy, 
He had to take all that armor and give it away. Now look, Jonathan was a prince. He was not a warrior. The armor bearer in the King James Version, or I'm sorry, it may be ESV, but one of the versions call him an officer. It says, when Jonathan came to his officer, this wasn't just some flunky they pulled off the street, just somebody to carry a sword. He was a trained warrior. You follow me? So in the heat of the battle, nose to nose with the enemy, he gives everything he ha Hey, you're a recruiter. How quickly could you get someone to come to battle? If you said, okay, why don't you come fight with us? It's 10,000 to one. And we're going to go in and we're going to fight. Would you join the army? And they'd say, yeah, let's go. I'm ready for a good fight. And then the soldier would say, the new recruit would say, where's my sword? And Kevin would say, oh, you don't get one. You don't get one. Oh, you can carry one. But as soon as the blood flies, you got to give that away. Now, just, just flash back to what we call an armor bearer, somebody with a briefcase and a Bible. And a, it's a little different, a little different. So Jonathan nudges his armor bearer and he says this, come on, let's go pick a fight. Let's go pick a fight. You know what the armor bearer says? I'm with you, heart and soul. Do you know how many of us just want somebody to say, I'm with you? Do you know the biggest deficit in our life is we don't have somebody with us? He said, yeah, I'm going. I'm going with you. I'll, die. I'll go with you. I'll die with you. I'll die with you. So we picked the story up here. Sorry, I'm, way, I'm, already, off, I'm already off track. <laughs> but I made a commitment. I have to tell the high dive story, even though I did not want to tell it for you that waited over just to get to hear the end of it. As we dive into this, as we go into these scriptures, I want to give you two points. And I got rebuked the first service because you're supposed to have three. Technically, a preacher's supposed to have three points. I only have two. I'll come up with another one. I'll fake one. Number one, you need to live before you die. And vice versa. You got to die before you can truly live. You need to live before you die, and you have to die before you can truly live. If you don't start dying to what's going on inside of you, you will never live. Jesus said that. That's point one. Point two is this. You have a decision to make in your life. You're either going to live a life of risk, or you're going to live a life of regret. You decide. You got a decision to make, friend. You're going to live a life of risk, or you're going to live a life of regret. Somebody say, maybe, maybe tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay, so we pick the story up in Samuel verse four, uh, 14, verse 8. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, come on then. We'll cross over toward them and we'll let them see us. If they say to us, wait here till we come to you, we will stay where we are and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that's our sign the Lord has given them to you. <laughs> this is crazy. This is nutty. If you know anything about war, the high ground is the strategic ground. He, he is, he's like, I mean, he's already given this guy, this armor bearer, this motivational speech, which says, maybe God will help. Maybe. I mean, if I'm like the armor bearer, I'm like, uh, duh, 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 duh. You, well, maybe I'll wait till tomorrow. Go back to sleep. I'm not going to go with it. I mean, you know, if, if you got to, and not only, not only is his motivational speech terrible, his strategy is the worst strategy I've ever heard in my life. We're going to stand out in front of them, the guys with the weapons and the arrows and the swords, we have one, and say, hey, here we are. And they're above you on a cliff. Oh, you don't get this, do you? We'll, we'll go there. We'll, I'll, I'll show you. Look, you don't have to study the, the, the uh, strategies of Eisenhower or Patton or Churchill to figure out this is a bad plan. This is not a good plan. <laughs> it's, it's, 
Jonathan says, come on then, we'll cross over toward them and we'll let them see us. I, 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 I don't know. Jonathan obviously, clearly Jonathan wasn't thinking like we think. See, I think Jonathan had this understanding that what he needed to do, he could not do in his own strength. He couldn't do it without God. It wasn't going to happen without God. I'm, I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of places you can go without God. How many of you have been those places? You can, you can do a lot without God. But there are things when you decide to step out of the invisible into the visible that you will not do without God. And Jonathan understands this. Jonathan, he kind of, he has got a hold of this. So Jonathan says this. He says, let's step across the line of faith. Let's step out into the open and let them see us. Turn to your neighbor and say, let them see you. He, said, he steps out and he look, I'm going to tell you, friend, there's a point in life where you have got to step out of the invisible into the visible. Well, I'm going to tell you, we love being invisible. We like it, man. It's comfortable. It's safe. Your toes don't get stepped on nearly as often. See, when you're invisible, nobody really knows what drives you. When you're invisible, nobody knows what compels you. Nobody knows what even makes you who you are. You can call it whatever you want, but it's invisibility. See, it's when you become visible that all of a sudden you start getting persecuted. It's, it's when you become visible that you get judged. It, it's, it's when you become visible that people critique you. It's when, they, it's when you become visible that people slander you and they start talking bad about you. It's when you become visible that they judge you. So why wouldn't we as Christians and just people, just humans, draw back to the invisibility? It's easier. Oh, I'll become visible maybe tomorrow. Some of you can be the most, some, and some of you are, you're the most amazing people I've ever known. You, you know, you're just, you're just, you're just awesome. Pastor Ignacio, man, he's so cool. He's had such charisma. He's so compassionate. He's so, he's so gentle. He's so understanding. Linda, she's so wonderful. She's so interesting. She's so caring. She's so thorough at her job. You can be like that and only let people see the you you want them to see and still remain invisible. And those people will never know what actually fuels you, what makes you outstanding, what makes you compact. Some of us are invisible with our faith. And we've lived our life saying, maybe tomorrow. I'll witness maybe tomorrow. I'll change maybe tomorrow. So Jonathan says this, we're going to step out into the open. We're going to let them see us. We're going beyond the point of no return. We're, we're getting out of this comfortable state. Space and we're stepping into this uncomfortable place. I love this place. I love this space. Did, did you know I have a reputation? I have a reputation. Oh, it's not the one you're thinking about. Not the one before I was saved that I'm so quickly to tell you about because you know what? You need to hear it because you need to know you don't need to be perfect to be used by God. Oh, Lord, there's life breathing into us. I have a reputation. As an evangelist, people have told me, man, you're bold. Man, you're, you don't care who you talk to. But I wasn't always like that. So I don't want you to leave here misunderstanding this point that when I was young, I was a total coward. Whatever the DNA is for a coward, I had that. I have that. I, I had that, okay? So, 
th this, just so you know, this is, this is my story. I, <laughs> oh. So whatever has happened to me over the years, I didn't come from the factory like that, okay? I wasn't born like that. I failed speech class because I wouldn't stand up in front of people and give a talk. My mother-in-law thought I hated her because I never spoke to her. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I can't stop talking. So I, I didn't just get tongues. I got my original one. So I was not bold. I was scared. I was totally terrified. I was scared of everything. We kept our grandkids a couple of day, uh, nights ago, and my son came home. I said, what'd you do while we went rock climbing? I said, oh, you did? What, what's it like? What's the place like? And he said, well, there's a, a tall rock, and there's this littler wall, a big wall and a little wall, a tall wall, a high wall, and a little short wall. Oh, that's cool. Which one's you going? Oh, we went on the short one. Okay, that's me. I, when I was young, I was afraid of heights. I still am not crazy about them. It's hard to work when you're gripping onto whatever you can get a hold of. You know, I helped Jim Bush on put metal on a roof one time and the wind was blowing and he's handing me up these 12 foot sheets of, and I'm hanging onto the ladder and, and he's like, okay, put it over there. And I'm like, over there? <laughs> he said, maybe we ought to get down on the ground. Good idea, Jim. I was afraid of heights. I was afraid of dogs. Can you believe I trained guard dogs? See, finally, after I was 10 years old, I realized you could, what, okay, I slept in the bedroom with my brother and we had this little dog. It was a terrier dog. His name was Brownie. And good Lord, that dog hated me. Uh, if, I, <laughs> if I didn't get it, I mean, the dog never bit me, but I was, the, it, this set forth fear in my life. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I was afraid of heights. I was afraid of dogs. I was afraid of the dark. I was afraid of roller coasters. I still don't like them. Now, I'm just not crazy about roller coasters. I'm sorry. Yeah, like my, when they would say, all right, everybody hold your hands up. I got one hand firmly locked around somebody's neck, whoever's the poor soul behind me. I had a lot of fear. I wasn't just afraid. I wasn't just fr afraid of those things. I was afraid of everything. So those things, the, it wasn't just those things. Those things were just an object of my fear. It wasn't just the things I was afraid of. It was, they were, they represented an object of my fear. The river. You talked about the river in your testimony. When I grew up in North Carolina, uh, we didn't get to do a whole lot of stuff. So when I was like seven, eight years old, I, 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 we just didn't do a lot. We worked. We worked on the farm. We were poor. There was a river that ran along my grandpa's property. It's still there. It's called Deep River. So what little swimming we did really was just like in waist deep water. But occasionally we would go to my uncle's or my cousin's place and they would take us to uh, a place called High Rock Lake. That's really where I learned how to swim. My brother threw me off the dock. Uh, Lord bless his soul. Uh, I mean, you know, this, yeah, there was no lessons. It was swim or drowned. I nearly drowned. It didn't, really, it didn't really help much with anything, but I did learn how to swim. I was really not good at it. I, uh, I mean, I, not to get off on a whole nother story, but at High Rock, there was these two diving boards. There was a low dive, and there was a high dive. And my uncle told me on the high dive that somebody died. They jumped off the high dive, they dived off the high dive, and they hit a rock. It was a lie. It took me 10 years to find out it wasn't true. But as a young boy, I'm just imagining, oh my gosh, really? They died? Yeah. So how did they know they died? Well, blood just came up out of the water. It's just like, you, know, you know how your mind just runs away. With, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, I'll never jump off that high dive. I, had, I, was, I was fearful. I was scared. Not only was I scared of heights, I was scared of the high dive. So I stayed on the low dive. Now, the big difference between the high dive and the low dive was that the low dive, no one was there, just me and maybe one or two other cowards. And the rest of the people were at the high dive. Now, this wasn't like the dives they have today because there was just a ladder. There wasn't steps. 
And these people were just, these kids were just constantly cramming on the high dive, you know? And so like, I'm, I'm like, I, I'm cool. I'm good. I mean, I don't need that in my life. Who needs that kind of adrenaline rush in their life, really? I mean, I, look, there's no line. I can just jump up and down off the low dive as much as I want. There's no problem, right? Everything's cool. I'm good. So I'm watching, you know, as these people are just going up and down, laughing, mocking me, judging me. Does anybody relate to the low dive life? Anybody? Okay, good. The rest of you are lying. It may be a little different dive, but there's something you're afraid of. So I'm watching as they, 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 they go up and down this diving board. They, they go up and they jump off and they go off and they jump off. <laughs> Fears are very real, you know? It's, it's one thing. I mean, you know, honestly, it's, it's almost adorable when you're three or four years old and you're afraid of something, you know? When you get eight or nine, it's a little more concerning, you know, being afraid of the dark at eight or nine. It's, it's kind of weird. And then when you're 14, 15, 16, oh my, you know, then, but I'm going to tell you when you're like 20, 21, 22, and you still have these paralyzing fears, like it was okay when I was six years old and I was afraid of dogs. But when I'm 19 years old and I'm afraid of girls, it gets a little more important. Because, you know, I, I can deal with the dog. I just won't get out of the car. But when my fear is so great of being rejected by a girl that I won't speak to a girl, then it's a little more concerning. Yeah. We all have fears. Yeah. So back to the high dive. In my heart, I really wanted to go off that high dive. Isn't it amazing how... Fear doesn't pay any attention to data. Have you ever noticed that? Like, okay, my uncle said somebody, somebody busted their head. I, I sat at that low dive platform for months, watching person after person after person jump off that dive. Little, little children, some barely born babies are diving off <laughs> this high dive. Nobody died. Nobody died. Multiple times they jumped off and jumped off and jumped off and jumped off. But I couldn't, that, the data made no difference to me. Because see, fear doesn't care about data. Fear is not rational. It doesn't make any sense. Most of the things we're afraid of, we, we, it doesn't really matter that we know that that's not going to happen. We're just still scared. We're scared. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> I finally, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't really know what happened. I, I don't know what compelled me to jump off that diving board. I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't. I can remember that day when I was telling this story, the first, uh, the first service, my hands started sweating. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I mean, this has been years ago. My hands start sweating. Do you ever have a situation in your life that your memory can take you right back to the emotions that were entangled in the situation? I mean, it just pulls you right back in, just like, just like you're right there. You know, just, just, it's just so amazing. I can remember, you know, okay, I've got the data. I know, I know I'm not going to die if I jump off. And getting in the car and driving home after a whole day of standing by the little diving board. And my brother saying, why don't you just jump off? Why don't you just go up? I'll go up with you. Why don't you just go up and jump? 
And I said, I will. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. So I don't know if it was just, it, you know, isn't it funny how people will shame, try to shame you into getting out of your fear? You know, like they'll, like they'll make fun of you, you know, because of your fear. See, they don't understand how powerful fear is, right? I mean, I don't care how much shame you put on me. If I'm afraid, I'm not going. I just ain't gonna go, right? <laughs> I don't know if it was just too much shame. I don't know if it was just finally I got enough data. I don't even know. I don't know what happened. But it was just like one day I was like, I'm, 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 I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to get in the line. And like there's this line. There, there's a line. And I knew if I get in this line, I, I'm okay. I, I mean, because I can get out of line until I get to the ladder. And once I get on the ladder, I, I, I mean, has any, is anybody scared of rides at the fair or, okay, one, two, honest, oh, Look, honesty is contagious. Have you ever been in one of those lines, one of those like crazy zipper rides, you know, where you, you see the pictures of the people and the steel shots and their faces all contorted, you know, and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to do that in just a minute. And there's this long line and you get in the cattle trough thing where you go this way and you go that way and you keep facing the same person in and out. And you notice the little kid like this, this high. Those are the ones I relate to. And they're terrified. And the closer they get, the more terrified. And then finally their little hands are going, ee! along the rail because they're just white knuckled. They're not even got to the place of no return yet. They can get out at any minute. That's the way I was. And the closer I got to the ladder, the more I realized this is a bad decision. Now, what am I doing here? How did this happen? And it was like, I'm, I'm trying to decide, okay, I'm going to cut out now. I'm going to get out now. I'm going under the rail now. And then all of a sudden, I'm on the ladder. And oh my gosh, there's no backing out. And this kid's pushing me from behind and my, my face is in one kid's butt and another kid's face is in my butt and I, I'm just going up the ladder and I'm being carried by the momentum of the crowd and I don't know what to do. Now there's no getting out. I'm trapped. This was a ladder. It wasn't steps. You can't turn around and go back. I, I, I still remember getting to, like, to the top. I mean, like at the top. I'm at the top and there's like the last step and I'm hanging onto these little chrome. I can still see them and my knuckles are white and there's like one step and I, I step up there and I, and I remember my brother said, don't look down. And I look down. I mean, you got to look down. And dear Lord, there's concrete on both sides. And I'm thinking, ah! I'm going to die. I'm going to fall off on the concrete, death by stupidity. I'll be the first one ever to die. And my life is over at eight. And then boom, you know, they're putting them like, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God. And I don't know how the other kids did it, but like from, I didn't realize it was so high. It didn't seem high from down there. But when I got up there, it was like, this is so high. And they would walk out that platform like it's really wide, but it was really skinny. So I'm like, oh God, don't fall off the sides. You know, whatever you do, don't fall off the sides. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm shaking and these kids are down there going, jump, jump, jump. I'm like, get out of my head. I'm, I'm terrified. I'm paralyzed. I, 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 can't, I can't tell you what I felt like. And so I get all the way out there until I'm off the platform and then there, there, there's nothing. There's just the board. And it's so long. You know? Like it's way out there. And, and, and you know, it's kind of like I'm with the rails and then I'm just like, whoop. <laughs> you know, I do. I, and I realized, I mean, it's like it just came to me. No. I can't do this. I, I'm going back. I mean, I'm going back. I, I mean, I already in my head, I was like, uh, excuse me, excuse me. I mean, I'm going down the steps. Excuse, I mean, I'm going to be polite, but I can't do this. And I back up and, but 
the one thing I missed in my great plan of escape here was behind me was the cruelest, meanest, most unforgiving, unempathetic person in the world, my brother. And I bumped into him and I turned around and he said, you can't go back. I said, get out of my way. I, I'm going back, get out of my way. He said, there's only one way down. and It's that way. I can't. He didn't understand my fear. He didn't understand. He didn't know. I, he, ooh, I was so angry. I was so mad at him. I was like, okay, I'm going off here. And I'm going to bust my head wide open and mama's going to kill you. I, I may die, but mama's going to kill you. And I, I, I got out to the edge. My toes on, you know, isn't it funny? Because they call it jumping off a diving board. I didn't jump it up, up at all. I didn't want an extra inch. I just, I just kind of fell. <laughs> you know, that kind of fall. Flat. <laughs> and I just, because uh, I expected to be dead. So I, and then I came up. It's like, oh, I'm alive. I did it. I'm alive. I'm no longer a low dive guy. I'm a high dive guy. <laughs> How many of us have moved out into what God wanted us to do? And when we got to the point and tried to stage our retreat, he was standing behind us saying, you can't go back this way. There's only one way from here. And then we got angry at God. We got mad at God. How many of you got mad at God and said, why? Why aren't you making my life easy? Where are you, God? When God's behind us saying, you can't come back this way. You got to go that way. God's calling some of you right now to the high dive life. He's calling you, some of you right now, get off the low dive. You're trying to retreat. You're trying to go back. And God's stopping right there saying, you can't go back this way. You got to go that way. It's time to jump. It's time to jump. It's time to step out of the invisible into the visible. It, it's, it's time to make that. It's time to let them see you. It's time to let them see you. It's time to quit saying maybe tomorrow. <clears throat> I think a lot of us are wondering why God doesn't show up in our life. You want God to show up in your life? Show up in your own life. You got to show up too. God's really calling us to something deeper right now. I know he's calling me to something deeper. So Jonathan tells his armor bearer, this is my great strategy. We'll let them see us. We'll let them see us. And then he says this in verse 9. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we'll stay there and not go. In other words, what he's saying is, if they tell us to wait, we'll stay here and die. If, we, if they tell us to wait, we'll stay here and die. Verse 10. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that'll be a sign that, they have give, that God is giving them into our hands. Now think about this. They're at a they're at a cliff on each side. The Philistines who have swords are on the high ground. All right? Jonathan says, if they tell us to climb up, we know that, they ha that we win. Okay? They're climbing up to someone with the advantage from above. You're climbing up. All you have to do is whack their head off as they come. So his strategy is crazy. But he said, if they tell us that they're coming down, then we know we're going to die. If they're coming down, they're climbing down, 
then Jonathan can just whack them as they come down. Do you see how backwards this is? Do you ever have God ask you to do something that's completely backwards? What do you mean you want to show us? Show myself? Maybe tomorrow. Not today. This is his strategy. <laughs> See, Jonathan had this really cool, what I would call an advanced mentality. I like that. So the Philistines, they did see them when they showed them, and they, and they, they back basically shouted out to them, oh, look, there's those Hebrew dogs. They crawled out of their holes. And the Philistines say, come on up here. We're going to show you a thing or two. And Jonathan goes, oh, this is it. This is the goosebump moment. Here we go. God's going to give them into our hands. And the, and the, and the armor bearer's going to, I, 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 I just don't look like God's going to give anybody. A, they, those look like some really big and very angry Philistines. You go on up without me. I'll meet you there tomorrow. No. <laughs> Isn't it funny how as people of faith, we love the word wait? Why do we center so much around the word wait and not so much around the word faith? Oh, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. Just, we'll just wait on the Lord. Huh. Why are we waiting on the Lord? Is it because we're so fast? You think he can't keep up with you? I think he's waiting on us. See, the reality is Jonathan knew that God was moving faster than he was. He knew God worked how God worked through history and that God only moves when people move. Oh, my. God could be waiting on us to move. Jonathan says this, but if they say, come up to us, we will climb. And that'll be a sign that the Lord is giving them into our hands. This is insane. This is crazy. This is not good battle strategy. You know, if we look at this book and we understand that this is a sacred text, that everything in this book is here for a reason. There's not one word in this book that's just thrown in there for any reason, right? Nothing. There's not one thing in here that's not strategically. This is a sacred text. So the next scripture says this. And Jonathan and his armor bearer, and Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet. Why, how, why did they say that? Now, I was pretty sure, you know, like, so I read that and I go, oh, he climbed up on his hands and feet. I thought maybe he levitated. I thought maybe the Philistines threw him a rope. No, it specifically said he climbed up on his hands and feet. You know why? Samuel, when he wrote this, he wanted you to know that they were completely defenseless. They had their feet and their hands climbing, just like my son said, they went rock climbing. There's not a sword in their hand. They're not Nehemiah. They're not working with one hand and a sword in the other. They are completely defenseless, climbing up to an enemy looking down on them. Their hope, their trust, their confidence, their security was totally in God. They had come out of the invisible into the visible. <laughs> wow. So Jonathan was saying, you just can't see it. Sometimes, you know what we need to do? We need to go unless we get a no. We just need to go and stop waiting on a no. Some of us, I mean, honestly, some of us are totally paralyzed waiting for God to tell us to do something. So we're so paralyzed waiting for God to tell us to do something that we don't do anything. We keep waiting. It's like, we keep waiting for a yes rather than a no. God's already given you a yes. God's already said go. Jesus told his followers, go. 
He, his, last, his last words were go. You know, we need to go. Two-thirds of God's name is go. He's all about going. He wants you to go. A lot of us keep waiting on a go, and we act like our entire life is a no. We're, it's like we're waiting for a go. We think God's automatically saying no. Jonathan said this. If they say come up to us, that'll be a sign from God. I love that. God's already given you a go. He just wants you to say yes. He just wants you to go. He has already given you permission to live the life you were created to live. You don't have to wait for a yes. You just got to go. You got to get going. But you say, I, I, going and doing what? You know, I'm willing to do whatever God says. I, I, just, I just don't know what it is. Is, it, is there anybody there? Anybody know what that is? Anybody feel like that? The most common question, the most common statement on these prayer lines right here is, I just want to know what God's will for my life is. Anybody going to be real enough and say, I've stood up here and said that? I've, I've prayed to God, God, I want to know what, my, what your will for my life is. I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to give you two verses that will explain to you from now on what God's will for your life is. Do you want them? Do you want them? Okay. Go to Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read this text. This, I'm going to read this verse, these two verses. I'm going to read them twice. I'm going to read, read it one time. I want you just to get it in your Bible, but I don't, I don't want you to read along with, with me. I just want you to look up here at me, but you need to mark it, okay? You need to dog ear it, whatever you do in your Bible. If you write in your Bible, God bless you. If you don't write in your Bible, put it back on the coffee table and go buy one you can write in. But I'm going to read it the way that we've been taught to read it. And then I'm going to read it the way I think we should read it. Okay? Philippians 8. I mean, I'm sorry. Philippians 4, verse 8. This will answer your question. Finally, brothers and sisters, and this is the way we've been taught to read it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Okay, stop. This is what we've done. We have taken this and we've ended up using this as our filter. Like we've said, okay, whatever's true, whatever's right, whatever's noble. This is the list. So if I take this list, if I can just do this list, then finally I'll know what God's will is for my life. It's like we've, it's, it's, we act like God's will. Honestly, we act like God's will is this tightrope of our life. And so what we wind up doing is we get on this tightrope and we step off the platform and we, okay, this is God's will. All right, still got one foot on the platform, right? God wants me to go here. And then God says, okay, I want you to go there. This is, all right, it's Peter. You got one foot on the boat, one foot on the water. Some of us never get any further than this. And then we go, oh God. And then we're paralyzed. And we never take another step. And the facts of the matter are, when you get on God's tightrope, see the world's tightrope is narrow and skinny and if you fall off you die. God's tightrope is wide. We, we have allowed the enemy to deceive us as to God's will and how wide his tightrope is for us. Awkwardly balancing on this tightrope, afraid we're going to fall. If you live outside of God's choices, everything gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. When you live inside of God choice, God's choices, everything gets bigger. Okay, so now I want to really read Philippians 4.8 the way I think we should read it. Finally, brothers and sisters, what? 
should I think about? Whatever. Whatever. Whatever is true. Whatever is right. Whatever is pure. Whatever is holy. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is admirable. Just pick a good thing and think of it. You don't have to think of one thing. Whatever is true, do you know how much truth there is? Whatever is lovely, look how much lovely stuff there is. You're not limited. You're not balancing on a tightrope. Whatever is admirable, do you know how many people I admire? Oh. See, when you step into this relationship of getting out of the invisible and into the visible with the creator of the universe, if you're, he gives you permission for your imagination to run wild. He's not telling you you can only think about anything. He's saying, think about whatever. Think about whatever. Oh, my gosh. All of the violence in our world today. It's just like JB was talking about. The violence in that country. The, I mean, you can't, you can't look at anything on social media. You can't look at any YouTube. The, the, our children are violent. You, you, you want a little narrow path? Do violence. Do greed. Do racism. Do anger. That's a very small, narrow path. And it makes you the very smallest, narrowest human being you can be. But if you want an expanded path, think about love. Think about purity. Think about what's at, think about whatever is good. I mean, I have people tell me all the time when I'm witnessing to them, sister, you know what they said? How can there be a God when there's so much bad? Look how much good there is. Why narrow yourself down to the bad? Think about what's good, whatever. Why limit yourself? Man, there's so much room on the whatever path. <laughs> you should feel free. Do you know how many things are noble? You can choose your own nobility. Do you know how many things are lovely? Man, so many things are lovely. Just pick a lovely thing. Just pick a lovely thing and think about it. You know, there are so many things that are beautiful. Man, how about doing this? How about just picking a beautiful thing and creating it? How, how, about, how about just expanding it? What should I do with my life? Create something beautiful. Create something true. What a, whatever is ad, admirable. Think about that. Whatever is admirable. Do you know how many people I admire? Wow. Some of them you'd be surprised at. There, some of them are in this room right now. This kid with the camera. I admire that boy. I admire what he's come over. I admire what he's come through. People looked at him when he was this high and thought, dear Lord. He had everything in the world against him. Now he's got a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter in her womb. He's a success story. I admire him. Do you know how many things there are that are admirable? Why do we focus on what's bad? My imagination could run wild for the rest of eternity, just thinking about what's admirable and what's lovely and what's pure and what's right. And you say, okay, yeah, all right, that's what we should think about, but what should we do? I'm glad you asked. The very next verse gives us the answer. What should we do? Whatever. Yeah, but specifically, what should we do, right? Let's just narrow it down. Look, okay, then just pop back up to verse 8. If anything, look how specific anything is. If anything 
is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about such things. Go crazy. Dream. Just God wants you to imagine and create. Just do whatever. Now, if you are choosing between good and evil, choose good. If you're choosing between right and wrong, choose right. If you're choosing between love and hate, choose love. If you're choosing between bitterness and forgiveness, choose forgiveness. If you're choosing between despair and hope, choose hope. You see how this works? You you see how easy it is? Just whatever. Choose what's beautiful. Choose what's good. You have an endless universe of possibilities. Paul said this, "Look look at me. Whatever you've learned, whatever you've received, whatever you've heard, what you have seen, do that. Pick that. That's what he's saying. Some of us are paralyzed because we're afraid we'll do the wrong good thing. Oh my. I better go on and dig on that a little bit because that just hit somebody. Some people are paralyzed because they're afraid they'll do the wrong good thing. But I don't know what to do. One thing I can tell you, you know know what God does not want you to do? Nothing. (laughs) Just do something good. Even in the physics of this thing, even if you break this completely down, make it really, really simple, even in the physics of, let's just say you're so proactive, you're so eager, you're so zealous, you want to go do something good, and you wind up doing someone else's good. You think God's going to look at you and say, What were you thinking? You did her good. Now she doesn't have any good to do because of you. I think God's a little more creative than that. I think when you do someone else's good, God looks at you and says, hey, that looks good on you. I've done a lot of good I'm not good at. I have. You know what I found out? When I'm doing good that I'm not good at, someone who's good at that good looks at me doing a bad job of that good and wants to do that good. My doing good, bad makes them, compels them to do good. So just do something good. How about we just start a revelation, a revolution of just doing good. You're not going to do someone else's good and God get mad. Do you know what I've also noticed? As I do good that I'm not supposed to be doing, it moves me to the good I'm supposed to be doing. Dear Lord, Pastor Gary, that is some awesome preaching. I am just really admiring you right now. Thank you. Whatever. Uh, We better skip this whole section then, right, huh? Man, you ought to be the freest person. This ought to free you up. This ought to free. You know what I get mad at? When people without God live freer than people with God. I don't get mad at the people without God. I get mad at the people with God. Because you should be the freest people on the planet. I'm going to tell you what, brother, sister. If you're captive, it's your fault. You built a cell. You locked it up. You threw away the key. Stop living in fear. Stop being paralyzed by what you don't know. Just pick a good thing and do it. Sometimes you just got to say, God, I don't know if I should be doing this. But I just know it needs to be done. So I'm going to do it. God has an amazing way to move you toward what you're supposed to be doing. I mean, who cares how many times you fall? Who Who cares how much you fail? Who cares how many times it doesn't work out? Who cares how many times somebody looks at you, and I've had it done to me, and say, 
And they say, I knew you weren't going to do good at that. I knew you weren't going to succeed at that. You know what? It's real easy for someone who's just watching life to judge yours. But people who are living life don't have time to judge your life. Boom. So you want to know what God's will for your life is? Whatever. It's whatever. Whatever it takes to make the world a better place. Whatever, whatever, as long as I create good in the world and I point it back to God. And talk about how good God is. Look, just go until you get a no. Just start going. Quit being frozen by waiting on a yes. It's time for us to get an advanced mentality. It's time for us to stop saying maybe tomorrow. It's time for us to start living today. Some people here, God's been calling you out and you've been saying maybe tomorrow. God's been offering you a life that you were created for and you've continually said maybe tomorrow. Some of us don't even like the life we have. Some of us don't even like the you we are. And God's saying right now, I can change you. I can make you different. I can make you better. I can give you a future. I can give you a future without regret. God's speaking to some people right now. I got a question for you. How many times do you tell God, maybe tomorrow? Right now is a specific moment in time. Just like we were talking about Saul and Jonathan. This is a specific moment. It's some of you need to leave behind the maybe tomorrow mentality. And God's calling you right now. Today, right now, in this moment. To say, this is my moment. This is a moment that will define my life. This is a moment that will shape my future. This is a moment that will define me as a person. This is time. This is the moment that I step out of being invisible into being visible. Some of us, we just really need to give our life to Jesus. Some of us, we have made that commitment, but we still are invisible. Some of us, are, we've committed to him. We've said the prayer. We've tried to do things right, but we're still saying maybe tomorrow. I want to ask you to do me a favor. I just want you to bow your heads right now, right where you are. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. This is not normally how I would do an altar call, but just nobody looking around. I want you to just take a moment. Take a moment. Take this moment. If you're ready to cross that line of faith, if you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, if you're here and you're done trying to do life alone, and, you're, and you, you know what you're saying, I'm tired of saying maybe tomorrow. I'm going to trust him as my Lord. I'm going to trust him as my God. I'm going to trust him as my Savior. If you're ready for him to give you the freedom and the forgiveness that he desires to give you, I, I want you just to, just to say this with me. Just, all you got to do is just whisper it to him. Just this one simple little phrase, Jesus, I give you my life. Just, just that simple, just that easy, just that, just Jesus, I give you my life. Some of, sometimes I think we've given him our heart, but we never gave him our life. And he, he's, he, that's what he's asking right now. Right now, just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Not tomorrow, not, not, not maybe tomorrow, but right now. Jesus, I give you my life. Because if you'll give him your life, you'll receive the life that he died for you to have. It's time to step out of the invisible and into the visible. It's time to seize this moment. Jesus, I give you my life. If you just whispered that to him, if you just prayed that prayer, if you're here in this room or if you're on the internet right now and you just prayed that prayer, 
If you just crossed that line of faith, if, if you just stepped into that space where you belong to Jesus and you're accepting his freedom, I want to pray for you. I, I want you to make a decision. I want you to step out right now of the invisible right into the visible. If you just confess that, if you just said, Jesus, I give, me, give you my life with no one looking around, I want you to make a decision. I want you to just raise your hand. You don't have to raise it high. Just, I just want to see. If you just said that, I'm, I'm giving you my life. Look at that. Hands all over the place. God bless you. Anybody else? Just say, Jesus, I gave you my life. Stepping out. Anybody else? Jesus, I give you my life. I see you. I see that hand. Thank you. Father, I thank you for all the men and women that in this moment just open their hearts up to you. I thank you, Lord, that they stepped out of the invisible into the visible. Thank you, Lord, that they crossed over that line of faith. God, I pray right now that you just wrap them up in your love, that you just cover them. Lord, I know you'll never abandon them. You'll never leave them. I thank you, Lord, for a new future and a new hope and a new life for them. And God, I just pray right now that you would begin to give them a sense of this defining moment that they just stepped into. Change everything in their life, Lord. I thank you, Father, for the commitment. Holy Spirit, I pray you come and that you just fill them right now. And Lord, we just thank you for this moment. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise for all those that just made a commitment to God? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No more maybe tomorrows. We're doing it today. Amen. Praise the Lord. As we close, we're going to put on some music. And uh, we would like to open up the ministry time for anybody who's sick, anybody who needs healing in their bodies. We're going to set a few chairs out. And if, um, if you, we're going to kind of keep ministry time just to healing and just to those who need uh, like a real emergency prayer. And we would love to pray for you. Um, if you made that commitment today, I want you to know God just invaded your room. He just invaded your space. And I am so proud of you. Welcome to the high dive. There's no place like it. It's scary. It's awesome. Let's all stand. We're going we're gonna to worship as we set up for ministry and if you need prayer you can come and sit in these chairs right now you can just come on make your way now we're going to go ahead and put a video on we're going to listen to some worship music but well, we got plenty of time don't be in a hurry to leave let let god just soak you i i encourage you with the song that we're going to play just listen to the lyrics listen to the words let it let it get down deep inside of you don't forget tomorrow night we have prayer seven o'clock so we'd love to have you guys come out and pray with us. Prayer's been extremely powerful recently. Don't forget to pray for our pastors. Pray for those that are in our congregation who, who are, uh, need uh, healing touches in their body. Pray for your families. Pray for yourself that God would continue to cover you, protect you, that he would put a bloodline of protection about you. But can I just pray over you right now before we end? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over every person that's in this room. Lord, I pray over everyone that's watching us on the Internet. I thank you, Lord, for your covering, your protection. I thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that covers them right now. Father, I pray that you make yourself real to them right now, that you are not only Jehovah Jireh, their provider, but you are Jehovah Rapha. Lord, that you're our healer, you're our great physician. We ask you, Lord, for your covering, your protection. We pray, Father, that you touch bodies. Lord, that you bring healing. And we thank you for your healing power. We thank you for your healing power. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for watching us if you're watching us online. And don't forget to tithe and give to your local congregations. Congregation here, we have the offering receptacle set up back in the back. So let's worship. We'll put a, a, a DVD on and we'll, we'll worship some. The altars are open. Ministry is open. God bless you. Thank you so much. As we come to the conclusion of our service, hey, thank you for joining us, being online with us. We so enjoy you being a part in our relationship.
being a part of what God is doing. We consider it an honor. We thank the Lord has given us opportunity to share what's happening here at Whitehorse with all of you wherever you are. I want to encourage you and remind you, if you would like to give, there are different ways to give. You can give online, whcc.net. You can give by phone by calling the church, 765-477-1111. You can send check or money order to the address here, 1780 Cumberland Avenue, West Lafayette, Indiana, 47906. Or you can come by and give in person. Your giving helps us maintain, sustain, and continue the work of the gospel and reaching out to the nations. Be sure to tithe your local church. Be a blessing to your pastors, your elders, and your leaders. Send your testimonies to us, please. We love to hear your testimonies and share them. My testimony at whcc.net. Be sure to pray with one another as we've come to conclusion. Let the theme of the message today and what Holy Spirit is doing be joined with faith that you might move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit and be blessed. Thank you for our relationship. Thanks for all you've done to help us carry out the vision. God bless you.